Nancy Slim Keith was the archetype for the California girl in post-World War II America, representing a new freedom for women and a casual, uniquely American style. Tall and beautiful, with the looks of an actress, she never had any desire to star in motion pictures, but her influence on Hollywood through her first husband, Howard Hawks, created lasting strokes of genius. An affair with Clark Gable and a lifelong friendship with Ernest Hemingway, who begged her just to let him brush her hair, Slim charmed everyone she met. But if you ask her what her secret to her success was, she'd simply tell you, I was just wonderful being wonderful. Full of grit and ambition, she was always true to herself, overcoming a childhood where she watched her baby brother burn to death and was forced to choose between her mom and her dad. Slim came through it all. Join us this week as we look at the story of Slim Keith, the original California girl. Nancy Gross was born in July 1917 in Salinas, California, and brought up in Pacific Grove, a working-class fishing village. Her father was a businessman who owned several small factories. He ruled the home with an iron fist, raging at her mother, Jews, Catholics, Democrats, and anyone who challenged him. Whatever love existed in her home died with her little brother. Her brother Buddy, who was eight, was standing too close to an open fire, and his clothes caught fire. Panicking, he ran, trying to outrun the flames. Slim and her older sister tried to catch him. When their mother finally caught him and put out the flames, he was so badly burned that he soon died. Her father blamed their mother and did so for the rest of his life and demanded a divorce. When Slim was 12, she was sent to convent school. Happy to be away from the house, her mother would visit her every weekend without fail, and her father rarely showed. One week he came and pulled her out of class, never one to mince words. He told her that he had left her mother and that her sister had also decided to leave. He offered Slim a deal. If you leave your mother's house, it will prove to the court she is an unfit parent and I won't have to provide any support for her. I will give you a horse, a little boat and a car when you are ready. Slim didn't hesitate telling her father. I love my mother, I am staying with her. Her father stood up and walked away. Slim didn't see him again until he was on his deathbed. After that, her sister would spread malicious rumors about her through the school, telling everyone Slim was a bedwetter. They never spoke again. In 1935, the year of her high school graduation, with the help of her mother, she bought a yellow convertible and cruised south to Death Valley to stay at the Furnace Creek Inn. The resort was a luxurious oasis in the desert frequented by Hollywood clientele. Most would stay for a few days or a week. Slim stayed for two months, fueling rumors that she had gone there to recover from an abortion. While there, she met William Powell, who took a paternal interest in her. Slim was never starstruck. She always had the uncanny ability to be herself. When Powell asked Slim why she wasn't in school, she shot back, why aren't you working? Powell called her his Slim Princess, and from then on, Nancy Gross was known simply as Slim. Slim's young life was one party after another, associating with celebrities and millionaires. In the spring of 1938, she convinced her mother to move to Sunset Boulevard. Slim wanted to find a rich husband, but avoided dating people with reputations or those who were considered dangerous, as in not taking no for an answer. At one of these parties at the Clover Club, she met Howard Hawks, who had directed such films as Bringing Up Baby and Scarface. At 42, he was twice Slim's age and had premature gray hair, which earned him the nickname, The Gray Fox. He was married with three children and his wife was suffering from a severe mental illness. Hawks was a gambler and loved women, believing them to be one of the perks of his job. He introduced himself to her using his favorite pickup line, do you want to be in movies? Slim simply told him no. You don't, he asked incredulously. No, I don't, she said with finality. But she was taken by Hawks and agreed to meet him for a swim at his house the next day. Hawks was known for a certain female character in his films, the so-called Hawksian woman. Bold, uncompromising, she stood up for herself, always challenging the male lead. He saw in Slim his ideal come to life. Within a few days, they began an affair. She said of the sex later, sex was simply a physical need for him that had no relation to the person he was with. But despite that, he had everything else. She wanted to live a life of splendor, and Hawks had the perfect package. 
saying in her biography he had the career, the house, the four cars, the yacht. That was the life for me. Because of his wife's illness, a divorce was difficult to obtain, but they soon traveled everywhere together. On one trip, they went to visit Ernest Hemingway, as Hawks wanted to purchase the rights to his book, to have and have not, to turn it into a film. Hemingway, the ideal of manhood in those days, was not content to sit around the house, so they went shooting, deep sea fishing, and barreled down swamps. Slim was right there beside them. Hemingway was deeply taken by her, and they stayed friends for the rest of his life. When she and Hawks finally married in 1941, it was Gary Cooper and not her father who gave her away. Their first months were happy, she designed her dream home, and she had the life of luxury she had always wanted. She was the heart of every party, charming the guests who loved her company. She even shared in his work, going to the studio, reading scripts, and advising. When she saw a picture of a model in Harper's Bazaar, whom she thought would be perfect for the lead in To Have and Have Not, Hawks flew the model to Los Angeles for a screen test, and the 18-year-old Lauren Bacall got the role in the film. Hawks even gave her the nickname Slim in the film after his wife. Bacall's most famous scene was also written by Slim. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. Hawks made advances on the young Bacall, but she had already fallen in love with the male lead Humphrey Bogart, and so instead he settled for her co-star Dolores Moran. Hawks had numerous affairs with starlets and a notorious gambling addiction, coming home at 3 a.m. every night. But what bothered Slim the most was that she felt he was a phony. Everything that was real about him was on the screen. She said years later, he pretended to people he was a boat captain, yet always got seasick. He told stories about how he had been a pilot in World War I, yet didn't know how to fly a plane. Tired and bored, she began an affair with Clark Gable. However, despite his stunning looks and his deep care for her, she grew bored of him. He just wasn't very interesting, she said. She also began to work as a model, gracing the cover of Harper's Bazaar and four other magazines in 1945. She embodied the Californian ideal, tall, good-looking, with a unique casual American style. She was asked to become the West Coast editor of the magazine, but by that time had become pregnant and refused the job. Her daughter, Kitty, Stephen Hawks, was born on February 11, 1946. The child did nothing to rekindle their marriage, and a few months after their daughter was born, Slim left her with a nanny and flew to New York for a month of relaxation and partying before flying down to meet Hemingway in Cuba. On one evening, Hemingway stood in the doorway watching her brush her hair. Can I do that? He asked. Why sure, honey, she said. And after 20 minutes of brushing, he threw the brush on the floor, sighing, you have no idea what you do to me. On this trip, she also met Bill Paley, who was single at the time and whom she found devastatingly handsome. After a few days, he asked her to come on the boat with them and do a month of traveling. She considered it, but ultimately refused. As she knew her marriage was ending, she turned her eye to Leland Hayward, the fast-talking Hollywood agent who had dated Katherine Hepburn and Greta Garbo. And unlike Hawks, he was a real pilot and one of the founders of Southwest. Hayward was married to Margaret Sullivan and had three children. Nonetheless, the two began an affair. When Hawks caught them together, he simply turned and walked away and was like a ghost in their house, ignoring Slim completely. Their marriage ended amicably, no tears, no anger, no sad reminiscences. It was as if nothing had ever been there, she said. Hayward also soon divorced, and the two got married in 1949 on the estate of William and Babe Paley. Reflecting on their time together, Keith firmly believed Hayward was the love of her life. When I lost Leland, I lost the best part of my life. He would leave her for Pamela Churchill, and slim Keith would remarry for a final time to a banker, Kenneth Keith. During her time in New York, Slim Keith became attached to a group dubbed by Truman Capote as Swans, a group of rich socialite women who considered him a close friend. The Swans would confide in Capote, and unbeknownst to them, he was sourcing material to use for a book. Capote would say Keith reminded him of his mother, 
a woman who abandoned him for her own New York ambitions. In 1975, the publication of La Côte Basque 1965 in Esquire would reveal the sordid details of Capote's swan's lives, taking down each in their own way. The excerpt of his book, Answered Prayers, explored the dysfunctional lives of his swans behind the veil of inspired characters and effectively ended Capote's relationship to high society and the women. Slim Keith would immediately cut ties with the author. The character allegedly based on her, Lady Ina Coolberth, is as unflattering as they come. Essentially the town gossip, he even intimated she had had an affair with her best friend Babe Paley's husband. Following the end of her third marriage, Slim Keith wrote, I was married to each for about 10 years. I guess that's about all I can hack. She devoted time to travel before her death in 1990. God blessed me with a happy spirit and many other gifts. What I was not blessed with, I went out and got. Sometimes the price was too high, but I've never been much of a bargain hunter. In the end, Slim Keith was a remarkable woman who stayed true to herself and never compromised. I hope you enjoyed this week's look at Slim Keith. If you like content like this, please like, share, and subscribe. It really helps keep the channel going.